Hello, everyone, and uh, a very warm welcome to the fifth in Solvable's new work series. It is great to have you all here. Uh, this is a, a very timely topic, politically, civically, and of corporate concern, which is around uh, climate transition. Honored and pleased to be joined by Peter Newell. Uh, Peter is a professor of international relations at the University of Sussex and co-founder and research director of the Rapid Transition Alliance. He's undertaken research, advocacy, and consulting work on different aspects of climate change for over 25 years and on energy transitions for the last 10 years. Peter's authored and co-authored myriad articles in five books. In fact, if you tried to try to read through all of Peter's work, it would probably take you the better part of a week if you did it all consistently in your day. Um, he, um, and the most recent one he has written on has been about the energy transition, which I encourage everyone to read. He sits on the board of directors of Greenpeace UK and is on the advisory board of the Greenhouse Think Tank. Uh, the conversation that I'd like to start with is kind of a big one, um, Peter, which is around the, around the question of, of, of rapid transition. And I've been spending a lot of time uh, recently with the writing of the Icelandic author, um, Andre Magnusson, who's written a beautiful book called On Time, On Time and Water. And he recounts uh, in that work the, uh, the challenges of uh, kind of looking back into ancient Egypt of the pyramids. And he talked about the economies that were built around the pyramids, that outside of Giza, you started with one pyramid. And the first challenge was, how do you build, uh, how do you build an economy in a labor force that is going to support the building of thousands and thousands of people and all the materials and everything that go into it in building the first period, pyramid, which took approximately 40 years. By the time you got to the second pyramid, you had a really good sense of how to do it. You had a labor force that was trained and you had expectations that there were gonna be more pyramids built. And what was interesting is he found in this research that after they built three pyramids, 120 years out, they started to ask the question, why are we still building pyramids? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think we're we're at this we're at a we're at a juncture now, and he talks about this juncture, especially. And I know you're a professor and teach uh, teach this generation that is part of the Sunrise Movement and all the kind of youth movements that are taking place, where they're no longer seeing the, us as a pyramid economy, uh, or or necessarily in their, our case a fossil fuel economy. And they see it radically different than those of us who have kind of been brought up in this kind of landscape of um, expectations around fossil fuels and what that enables. What in your, this is a big open question, what do you think makes the business of rapid transition so difficult? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for organizing this session, you and May and, and all of you who've joined. Um, yes, it is, it's a huge question. <laughs> And I think partly it's because there's a lack of consensus about the ends of transition, like where we're hoping to get to, what's the end point of transition, or is it the case that we're always in transition? Um, so, you know, there's contestation around where we're trying to get to um, and what the parameters of that look like. Obviously, there's discussion more and more about a 1.5 compatible world, and that flows from the Paris Agreement. But even there, many other institutions are still pushing back against that, um, either overtly or covertly. And so, you know, there are, again, there's interesting developments, things like the IEA reports, you know, a couple of weeks back now, I think it was, um, taking that scenario far more seriously and saying, you know, this, this is where we need to be aiming, aiming for. But there is that contestation about the end, where are we trying to get to? So that's the sort of, you know, where do we want to be as a society? What is sustainable? All those, you know, fundamental questions. But then also, the even if we can agree on that, then the means by which we get there, um, you know, we can see this in all, all debates about sustainability. How far is, is it a question of plugging in a different set of technologies or a different set of energy sources, but all other things stay the same? Or is it a question of re rethinking the design of the pyramids to go back to your <laughs> opener there? Do we need to rethink questions of work and income and production and consumption in a more fundamental way? Um, and that's a bigger conversation about ends and means and growth and all those sorts of things. Um, so, so it's partly that, you know, the trying to get agreement and consensus about where we're trying to get to, also the means by which we get that, and also who then leads on that. Is this something we're expecting governments to do? Obviously, they have the convening power to bring together the key actors uh, involved in a rapid transition, but they often don't have the means to ensure a rapid transition. 
you know, a lot of that means mobilizing business actors or cities or us as households and consumers. So there is a massive governance challenge about how do you steer society in a different direction and how do you scale and deepen change at the same time? Um, so that's part of the answer to why, why the business of rapid transition is so difficult because we can't agree on ends and means <laughs> as, as two, two key things. There's many other things I could say, but maybe I'll start with that. I think that that's great. And so that's a great starter um, and segue. So we're going to um, go ahead and set up everyone into breakout groups. And I think even what Catherine just shared uh, is this question around is transition redundant and when does it become so um, if it's a case that of infinite optionality. So just uh, what we're what we'd like to encourage you to do is when you get into your breakout group, introduce yourselves to each other. You should be in breakout groups of three or four, and then discuss. I think uh, there's a couple things to discuss that we'd recommend. What does transition mean to you, and how are you seeing transition uh, in in certain terms of systemic uh, lens, whether it's within your own community, city, uh, in the in the governance structures, uh, could be globally um, as well as in a corporate setting. Where are you seeing transition taking place and where do you think the opportunities really are to get things unstuck? Welcome back, everyone. Uh, feel free to use the chat to share anything that came up for you in the conversations that you had. I hope the breakout group was fruitful. We will also, we're going to go in, for those of you that just joined us, uh, we're going to go into about a 20 minute conversation and then you'll get a chance to reconnect with your same breakout group to discuss further. So. Peter, uh, on picking up back where we had left off around this discussion about means ends, one of the things that really uh, struck me in our conversation was this relationship between urgency and, uh, and process and equity. And so I hadn't really thought about it in this way that, you know, from the certainly from the sustainability community for quite a long time has been pushing timelines and been pushing we all see you know we've been acutely aware of the timelines that we have we've been now we're sitting here with you know a very clear date and milestone of 2030 and one of the things that you pointed out to me that was really illuminating was if in this speed that we are creating or this sense of urgency that we're now creating because we've kind of boxed ourselves into this now nine year window of urgency for action in order to get down to a zero carbon economy by, by 2050, um, that it also becomes a vehicle for uh, being able to reinforce those that already are institutionalized as powerful agents with whether it's uh, governments, uh, corporations, etc. And also will it can be used as a rationalization for shortcutting uh, process. So uh, and so I'm could you share some of your thinking about that having worked both in the activist space and within so many aspects of government and corporations about this kind of conundrum around uh, how we encourage or the urgency of transition, but still do it in a, in a way that is um, going to result in the future, the ends in the future that we actually are trying to create. Yeah, thanks. It's a fantastic question. And it comes up all the time, really, in these debates about just transitions um, and how, as you say, we, we go for sort of deeper transformative change within a short period of time um, without losing some of the the, um, you know, the need for inclusiveness and equity and getting all actors on, on, on board, because you often hear that given the short time frame that we're talking about, um, we need more sort of top down solutions. So advocates of geoengineering or nuclear or fracking, or whatever it might be, say, um, we haven't really got time to rethink society. We haven't got time to go for a more open ended, deliberative, bottom up participatory process about the type of society we would like to see because we're doing this against the clock. We've got, as you say, you know, nine or 10 years now. So what that means is you need to leave power in the hands of governments or corporations or scientists or others to come up with a, a plan. It's this sort of cockpit mentality. They're steering the, <laughs> the, um, the great um, spaceship Earth um, and they will come up with some solutions which need to be enforced. And you can see this in practice sometimes. Um, like in the UK, for example, Lancashire Council um, made a decision to ban fracking um, and that decision was overridden by the national government, citing the climate emergency. 
saying, you know, we need, we need fracking because it's a lower carbon, very debatable, but <laughs> it's a lower carbon option and therefore we need to, to go for that option. In other words, there's no time um, to allow opposition to those sorts of things. Um, so it opens up a whole set of questions about, about the role of institutions in, in mediating some of these things. There clearly are parameters and timelines and we need more ambitious goals and leadership. Um, but if it is done in a very top-down way, you'll often get strong, uh, a strong backlash. We've seen this in France, for example, the Gilets Jaunes, right? If you push through a, a fuel tax or a carbon tax, it often provokes strong protests from the ground up if people feel that their voices and needs are being bypassed. Um, so I think there is a really important role for, for bringing different actors on board. Um, but you see these arguments, as you were suggesting, deployed by elites or more powerful actors to try and frustrate progress. Um, and I see this in, in discussions around just transitions, for example, where uh, it's often argued that um, until we take into account all the potential negative impacts or knock on in, uh, repercussions of accelerated and more ambitious climate action, that we can't do anything. So you might hear the coal industry saying, well, look, until we've got retraining and compensation packages in place for all of these communities, we can't go for this more aggressive phase out policy or this managed decline. Uh, and it's interesting to me that these are not arguments you hear used by many other sectors. You know, businesses routinely uproot their operations and go elsewhere, but we don't normally have a discussion about, but hang on, where's the compensation package or where's the retraining package? So these arguments about justice and inclusion sometimes get mobilized by powerful actors to slow down the pace of change. So there is this, this tension. I mean, for me, I think um, climate is one of the key things, but there's obviously a whole range of sustainability challenges we're trying to, to address and they are intimately interconnected. Um, and if you want more actors, cities, businesses, citizens involved in deciding and shaping positively the sort of future they want. So there's real ownership and then and therefore greater likelihood that these policies come to be realized and acted out. You will have to have that participation. It can't just be a case of, of top down. But that conversation has to be bounded by some sense of carbon budgets and timeframes. That's the, that's the provisor. That's the way I try and reconcile these things. So to just give you an anecdotal example, at the Bonn climate negotiations a couple of years ago, there was a discussion about just transition, and it was largely led by governments and trade unions um, who were all talking about the process, this um, you know, open-ended process, getting all stakeholders involved, making sure all voices are represented. But no one at any point mentioned the fact, the glaring elephant in the room, <laughs> that the bulk of the coal reserves had to stay in the ground. You know, all the governments that were on this table talking about this had signed up to Paris. And we know how many of those reserves are already unburnable. So let's have a conversation about really the three or four coal mining areas that we're actually talking about, rather than this broad, open-ended conversation about um, you know, these different futures. So I think participatory, yes, deliberative, yes, but bounded also by <laughs> a sense of timeframes and carbon budgets. And it's that part that sometimes gets lost, I think, in, in these conversations. One of the things we discussed uh, is how one country's uh, energy transition can be done at the expense of other countries. And you were helped, some of your research has really helped make me aware of that. It's actually um, one of the things that uh, Musa, who's on this call, and I were talking about with a Canadian um, company that is going and uh, doing exploration in Namibia. Um, I, I really, and of course, it doesn't count against the carbon budget of Canada. It counts against the carbon budget of Namibia. Um, so I'm quite, I'm really curious about kind of how, uh, how do you see these you know, as you talk about this landscape of how do we have this conversation about the global global reserve or a global commons that would be something like our fossil fuel reserve. Um, and what the language that I appreciated that you use, which is actually very similar language to a psychologist um, named Sally Weintraub, which is what does a model of care look like beyond our borders? Uh, and how do you, how do we actually talk about resources within a model of care and stewardship yeah, another great question and, and not an easy one to resolve. <laughs> and again, I guess it's worth reminding ourselves that these, these debates have a long history. This isn't the first time we've had to think about extraterritorial responsibility, right? I mean, there's long debates, as you probably know, on, on the legal side around duties of care and supply chain responsibility and all of these sorts of things. And I think that's one of the ways we get into this because 
if it is just about national low carbon energy transitions, then there is the possibility that more powerful states might pass on the costs to other societies. As you said, the emissions appear in other parts of the, the global south. Um, or there's the green grabbing phenomena that some people talk about. You know, we want to go for a lower carbon transport, therefore we'll go for a biofuels boom, even if the consequence of that is acquisition of land in parts of Africa or Asia or wherever it might be. So there has to be some global responsibility because in, in, in when it comes to tackling climate and all these other issues, it's ultimately the global game we're playing, right? So if we're just displacing emissions, if they come down in the UK or in Canada, but they rise in Namibia, to use your example, or Kenya or somewhere else, then we're, we're not making any progress. So it has to be that, that global picture. And I think the only way to keep that global picture in mind is obviously through global governance institutions, partly the UN, but you know there may be the need for, for innovations around those things. Um, one thing we've been involved with, and, and Vancouver actually, where you're based, Adam, has, has um, come out in favour of this, is a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. So it's a you know, the idea of a global agreement that would fairly phase out remaining fossil fuel reserves. And of course, the expectation is that richer countries would lead, lead first and poorer countries much later on, uh, subject to getting support to, to adopt alternative energy pathways. So you need that sort of meta interstate framework. But I think it also has to be about supply chain responsibilities, you know, and we, of course, we've got roundtables on things like beef and soy and, and uh, palm oil and things like that. But those things need to be strengthened uh, as well. Um, so I think precisely going back to our previous conversation around urgency, we need to use all of these levers all at once. You know, for sure, let's push for greater multilateral oversight so that it's not just a question of countries pushing um, the costs of low carbon transitions onto others, which is, you know, partly what we're seeing now with the, the boom around electrification, right? There's the drive, you, know, you get a lithium rush or a cobalt rush in DRC, uh, the lithium triangle in Latin America, there's these areas where patterns of mining or exploitation are intensified in order to meet our need for decarbonisation in Europe or North America. Um, and that's clearly not, not the way forward. Um, and I think, you know, that's, it's inevitable that powerful countries and corporations will, will try to do that. We need the mechanisms to, to roll back against that. Some of them will be um, legal frameworks within national countries that impose a duty of care on, on, um, on how we use our aid money, for example, or through trade and investment agreements, but also privately through supply chains and putting pressures on business. And of course, civil society also has a role, which is doing quite well in some cases in exposing double standards and the lack of duty of care. Um, so I think all of those mechanisms are the ways we have to address that that phenomena that we're talking about here where you get this outsourcing and displacing of responsibility uh, to other parts of the world. And I, I, it makes me think about how um, the relationship that we have between uh, national governments and the multinational corporations, particularly where they're headquartered, and that if we're challenged to even figure out how a tax, a tax um, system can even work for these multinational corporations that come back to the national economy. How are we going to create, how can we create, or what examples are you seeing of interchanges between um, home governments, national governments, and the, and the companies who actually are, uh, call their, call that nation their headquarters in being able to be more accountable towards, um, towards these, uh, these, the broader goals of, of the country that they actually are part of. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a whole range of things that governments can do if, they, if, they, if they're so disposed. And of course, then there's a big role for civil society and other organizations and more progressive businesses in, in pushing in that direction. So we have things like science-based targets, you know, where some businesses, Unilever, Tesco's, others are coming forward and saying they'll abide by those things. And I, th I think one of the key things is to say that then becomes the sectoral norm. You know, you put pressure on other companies to sign up to those sorts of things. But the other things governments can do are around disclosure of, of emissions and pushing for scope three and pushing responsibility along the supply chain. There's a role for corporate governance. You know, we've seen in the last couple of weeks, shareholder pressure on Chevron and other companies. Um, you know, so there's clearly things around disclosure, around um, the corporate governance and the responsibilities of boards and CEOs to take on board some of these issues. Um, so to go back to the previous discussion we were just having, that they do still have responsibility for how their suppliers um, 
source materials and so on. It's not enough, enough to say, well, we're just at the end of this, this complex supply chain and we have no direct control over it. Those sorts of things can be regulated for, and, and it is about systems of transparency and disclosure and governance, closing the tax hole loops that you talked about. There's a whole range of things there that I think can start to move things forward, but it is also a deeper governance challenge because of the speed that we were talking about. It really is about undoing incumbency <laughs> in a way. That's a bit of an academic way of saying, really, we need to roll back the power of some actors that are actively obstructing the moves towards a lower carbon economy, um, all of which bring about injustices for other poorer people um, you know, within richer countries, but particularly in the global south. Um, so you know, those things have to be addressed. And that then becomes about party funding. It's about the revolving door. Um, it's about who sits on which committees, um, all of those sorts of things. Um, and it can also be about new, bold governance innovations, things like representation for future generations in policy processes. You know, we have that in the parliament in Wales, um, we have it in Israel and Hungary and various places um, where a sort of right of veto or a check at least um, is given to someone who clearly indirectly but represents future generations to say you're not going to just keep passing these costs into the future. Um, those sorts of things, I think, make a big difference or independent climate change committees like which we have in the UK, where it's above the political fray and they manage the carbon budget, they hold governments to account. Um, those sorts of things, I think, are, are really important um, so that, that that's the way you, you keep the urgency part <laughs> in the frame by saying we're missing our carbon budgets. You know, you can't just keep pushing these things into the future or magically assuming that other sectors are going to mop up the, the difference because you're wanting to protect aviation or the car industry or whoever it may be. So I think there's, there's a role for a whole series of governance innovations there to, to deal with some of the issues that you're um, pointing out there. Yeah, and I think those policy examples that you shared are really are really interesting. And um, and I think that you also in your both in your research and in our conversation, you shared some of the examples that you're seeing in what we would consider um, kind of big changes in the way in which governance actually functions, particularly at a, at a municipal level, where I think that we tend, at least in Canada and the United States, to kind of roll forward with our existing governance structures and keep rotating the cast of characters who are in power rather than actually shifting the very natures of how, um, how governance actually happens within a civic society. And I think that um, some of the examples that you shared and maybe some, I think the audience, you know, the people here would really benefit from some of those examples from the citizens assemblies to the other things that you're seeing um, within the UK and the EU where there's a lot of leadership that's actually taking place that I think give us kind of some shining examples and some hopefulness that we can bring these over to across the Atlantic onto our shores uh, to, to change some of these governing structures. Yeah, yeah, no, I think there's this really interesting things going on around, yeah, as you say, um, citizen assemblies, climate assemblies, and I've been involved with one locally here. And, and actually it's quite attractive for policy communities or some of them, some of them are reluctant to sort of cede power <laughs> um, to, to another organization. But on the other hand, most governments, I think, and not just governments, clearly corporations and others, are struggling with how to sort of make all of this add up. How do you keep climate alongside sustainable development and efforts to try and tackle poverty and all these sorts of things? So actually giving people this role as, as, a, as a policymaker in a way, you know, you, you deal with some of these trade-offs. <laughs> What's your sense of how we get, um, you know, vibrant economies that are also high in employment but generate um, positive environmental outcomes um, and present them with some of the evidence Look, we could go for you know pedestrianization in the center that's fantastic but what happens to those businesses that still need you know trucks and, <laughs> and cars coming in how are you going to resolve that but then as as a community as a sort of cross uh, cross sample a representative community of people working through those things deliberating on them and coming up with suggestions is a really empowering and democratizing thing to do so in a way it helps politicians use uh, the public as a sounding board but also gets their input and and a sense of ownership and i think there's something really powerful and important in that it can't be a way of delegating responsibility and saying okay it's your problem now we <laughs> we uh, you know passed on all responsibility to you but it can be a way i think of enhancing um, policy and and demonstrating that there is willingness to do this because as an academic in the UK Rebecca Willis has did 
wrote a really uh, interesting book on climate change recently. And she was talking to a lot of politicians about why don't you go further on this? Why are you not more ambitious? And what came up frequently was this real fear of going too far too fast. You know, that you say too many bold and ambitious things and you don't bring the public with you. Um, and so finding ways to show that people are keen on action and that if it's done in the right way and if it's also delivering a just transition, there's often a lot of support for that. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's getting those um, cycles of reciprocity moving, I think, you know, where we, we pub the public, citizens, consumers, demand more of politicians. They then are emboldened to go further and that creates more space for us <laughs> to do our own thing, to push more ideas, to, to show what's going on. Because for me, that's the other thing. There's so much that is going on. Um, and, you know, I'm part of this Rapid Transition Alliance and, and our strap line is evidence-based hope. <laughs> so we're trying to show that these things are happening all around the world, around energy, food, water, uh, in cities, around finance. And they've happened in the past. Um, so it's really just about showcasing what's possible and putting the pressure on and saying, well, why not? You know, um, it's possible in London. Why not in Ottawa? This happened in Lagos. Why not in Nairobi? Um, you know, using that evidence base of how and when change is possible, or how rapid transitions are, are being enacted now and have been enacted previously to really push change. Um, so that for me is how is hopefully how we will get there. It's that ratcheting up the mutual accountability, bringing in more voices um, and pushing all those levers as hard as we can all at once. <laughs> I just, what I, I'm kind of stuck in this, you know, like as you, I guess, as you've made me aware of it, the question of how to use deadlines and time and whether it's actually really uh, more destructive than it is constructive for the kinds of conversations that we need to be having right now. Yeah, it can be. I mean, I think for certain actors, I mean, those responsible for delivering on carbon budgets like governments, yes. they, we, we have to have them. <laughs> um, otherwise, they'll always slip. But in terms of putting time limits on open-ended community building, envisioning of alternatives, then I don't think you need to say, right, come up with a plan for how to get your city to zero in three months or else, you know, that, that type of thing is not, not helpful where you're trying to really nurture something and you don't want it to be a stressful, rushed experience where, you know, as, I think as you were hinting at, it's always going to be powerful actors that say, well, don't need, to, we, you know, no need to discuss this. We've got the answer. Here you go. <laughs> um, it sort of, it lends itself to that type of politics and you have to be very careful about that. But when it comes to, you know, keeping fossil fuels in the ground or <laughs> certain other things, I think limits, budgets, stricter timeframes make a lot of sense. You know, you have to be very clear about these are some of the problems. What's the phase out? period you know um and there's being really there's, really clear about that because otherwise people are always pushing up against budgets and time frames or rolling forward things and this is this is how it works just pushing as we were talking about pushing problems onto other parts of the world other other regions and other generations future generations and you have to really guard against that and sort of make budgets real <laughs> and time frames real for those that have that responsibility um but I think for those nurturing processes, the building, the imagining, the alternative stuff, um, that has to be a bit more open-ended um, because you are trying to ultimately build, bring a new society and economy into building, and that that does take time. Yeah. That's not the not that's not the sort of thing that can be done against the clock because you have to sort of deal with and negotiate a whole set of different, uh, you know, difficult challenges and problems. And how do you think about the? Um... That totally makes sense. Uh, thinking from a government, especially the governmental, but also the intergovernmental piece, which is that they need standards that are shared standards that are clearly yeah. communicated across them. How do you think about it from a corporate standpoint about time and these the deadlines, the race to the you know the net zero goals and the race to zero? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing is about um, you know terms of office of CEOs and all those sorts of things. I think that there has to be, you know, much clearer alignment between the incentive structures that operate internally and their external obligations, you know, to try and find ways of sort of creatively aligning those things far more. And I think the science-based targets, things like that are a useful way of saying, okay, if this isn't, you can't just say, okay, we'll do this by 2050. It has to be, 
you know, every few years, clear reporting on progress and you as CEO and with your board have to show that what's, what are the mechanisms by which you're going to deliver this. So it's very, very, you know, and I think also as a corporation or business people I talk to, that's the way they make it manageable anyway, because it's such a huge thing otherwise. You know, what does this actually look like team by team, unit by unit, supply chain by supply chain? How on earth are we going to get to this ambitious figure? The way you have to do it is to sort of have a, almost a yearly or <laughs> probably less than that plan about exactly what this is going to look like and what your indicators of progress and so on. So I think although people push back against um, more ambitious timelines and budgets and so on, I think in reality, they're doing it all the time. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's just sometimes not the right ones. <laughs> yeah, <definitely. laughs> I, think that's the... I, I think you're right. And I, that's, it's interesting because we're involved in a couple of different projects that involve bringing in SBTI uh, into organizations. And we're always, <laughs> it seems like we're advocating for much shorter timelines than they, than they yeah. really want to, because they, they, you know, it's, it's, it, the problem is not as acute as governments who turn over leadership roles every two to six years um, necessarily yeah. in a corporate stand, standpoint, but certainly if you're looking at 10 to 30 years, you're going to have massive leadership changes over that period of time. And, yeah. um, and, and these, they're cumulative effects, right? Obviously, yeah. and that's where, and I think SBTI does a good job of um, articulating this kind of cascading yeah. plans narrative too as part of setting targets. Yeah. And I think if you look at the history of sort of regulation and, and business responses to environmental issues, whatever target you initially set, it's always said this is too ambitious, we can't do it, the technology is not there. Um, I mean, if you look at like the history of ozone or chemicals regulation or any of these areas, it's always the same thing. That's a ridiculous target. There's no way we can do it. This is going to lead to job losses and you know drops in growth and all that stuff. And nearly every time, somehow <laughs> they end up delivering, you know, with with some pushing and carrots and sticks and all the rest of it. Um, but you know, I mean, we've seen that in this country with the drive towards the phase out of petrol cars, you know, but in 2030 that was and still some are fighting that and saying it's too ambitious it's not doable etc um but you know you just sometimes you just have to set those sort of bold targets this is what needs to happen and then things do start to realign there's always going to be fighting against it and then others start to see okay there's a there's a an opportunity for us to really dominate this market <laughs> or to you know go from a from a niche to a sort of more dominant technology and uh, and the first move all around the ozone Story, you know, as ICI and Pond were the sort of two key players. Um, DuPont had already had the, the phase out of CFCs and therefore wanted to sell the substitutes they had to Europe. So then they were pushing really aggressively for a phase out treaty, you know. Um, so there's always that, you know, it can't be done, science isn't there, so timelines are too ambitious, technology's not aligned up yet. And then more or less every time, if governments can hold their nerve and be bold on this, because these companies want to make money and normally have the finance and technological wherewithal, it's just about priorities and markets and reorganizing supply chains, then these things can be delivered. Yeah, I appreciated, um, uh, I really appreciated the example you gave early on and I saw Eric, uh, it resonated with Eric as well about um, corporations have shown, demonstrated over and over again, their ability to be agile, <laughs> to, yeah. to, to market opportunity and constraints, right? So. Yeah they um they're actually very good at it regardless of what they might say externally yeah, um exactly. to, in the marketplace or even the initial resistance that may come is that once they once they actually internalize it um they they can they can turn yeah. pretty quickly yeah and what i what i think is there's often an external face which is about this is too fast it's too ambitious we can't do it but internally they're already preparing for that scenario right i mean even yes. bp and shell and others years ago they had an internal shadow market price right for carbon yeah. all yes. the while saying this isn't serious it's not a problem you know yeah. <laughs> so and that you know from a sort of rational corporate point of view that makes sense it's like try and buy yourself time you know yeah. fight this off for as long as you can but meanwhile get ready for them for what's coming um, and so when it does come and you lose that battle against it, you're ready to roll, you know, yeah. it, make, it makes perfect sense um, for, in terms of corporate strategy. Um, Peter, you're right. I think, you know, they, the, this is what they do all the time. And they sort of say, oh, we can't deal with this uncertainty and, uh, and you know, with this shifting environment. What well, any business lives with that all the time, you know, <laughs> your supply chains can get severed overnight by some natural disaster or a 
dropping price of a commodity or some scandal that erupts, anything like that. You know, you're constantly dealing with this endlessly shifting terrain. So it's, you know, for me, that suggests they can deal with climate change if they really want, and other issues if, if they really want to. But the idea that they're just, they're, they're so, you know, rigid and focused on what they do and they can't possibly adapt yeah. doesn't really hold, doesn't really ring true for me. <laughs> yeah. Clearly, clearly it's easier for some, some are more agile, there's different corporate structures, different ways they're financed, all of those sorts of things. I, I'd like to um, ask the a last question, which is a, a kind of big one, but based on your um, kind of decades of research in this space and, uh, and incorporating the idea of time and rapidity into multiple things that you're involved with, how do you think about our time horizons? Uh, and and, and how, does that, how does that impact your way of working? My way of working? Um... I mean, I guess for me, it comes back to the conversation we we're having before. It's the equity urgency thing. I, I see a lot of you know, the time frame, the emphasis on budget, on limits, and all of these sorts of things comes up a lot when you're talking about behaviour change, whether you're talking about shifts in production and consumption. Um, and for me, I try to position those things not as constraining things, but as enabling things. You know that necessity is the mother of all invention ultimately i mean i know there's a lot of business people on on this call businesses really want as much certainty as they can get often about you know what are the rules of the game what's the direction of change um where can we compete and on which terms legitimately <laughs> um and having clear frameworks and rules around those things i think can be quite transformative so although discussions around limits and carbon budgets and all these things feel like they're inhibiting progress. Um, for me, it's also, it's, it encourages the imagination. Okay, we're facing these very, very difficult challenges. We need to get much smarter about how we use resources. We need to work in different ways. We need to travel in different ways. We need to produce energy in different ways. But those are all massively exciting opportunities as well, right? For people with the brain power, the technology, the finance to do things in a different way. Um, and, you know, I think it's also just, socializing that idea of 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 limits um that that there are certain things will have to change and they have to change within a certain time frame um but that collectively we can we can do that we are doing it in different ways again we have done it before coming back to what i was saying before um so time constraints budgets don't have to be a disabling thing they don't have to be something that inhibits creativity and innovation i would argue quite the contrary it's something that should really um be seen as an opportunity uh, it's a challenge for sure but it's also an opportunity for all of us to sort of build a society that you know um we're proud of and that is sustainable and and constitutes the place that we want to live um we uh i would like to, to use this uh, space in your breakouts as a prompt to uh, imagine uh that hopeful future that Peter has uh, has set up, and use it as a as a creative space to speak in your groups for approximately about eight seventeen minutes about what do you see as the imagine of possibilities for transition, and that could be a civic uh, civic transition. It could be uh, a, a multilateral um, corporate and and public sector um, how what do you think are the creative possibilities and kind of use this uh, breakout space to really start imagining what the transition looks like that is not one that has been necessarily based on what we've done to date but what we might do going forward uh, we had a couple questions that came in just before we went into our breakout groups and uh, Peter uh, uh, volunteered to respond to both of those questions. I also want to invite you if there are questions that arose within your breakout group in this last session, feel free to post those questions in the chat. We may or may not have time to actually get to them uh, before we close at noon Pacific time, but please, I think the questions that you perhaps we're wrestling with would be really interesting to others. So I'll turn it over to Peter. Right, yeah, and thanks for these questions. These are uh, big, huge questions again. <laughs> so the first one on, on scalability, I guess it partly depends what you're trying to scale, but let me sort of try and relate it to some recent work we did on um, scaling behavior change. Um, so this was a report, it was a Cambridge Sustainability Commission on scaling behavior change. Um, and 
in terms of what makes it effective, what in the end, what we ended up arguing was that you needed we needed a sort of two pronged strategy. So scaling for for most people, for most behaviours, is about shifting infrastructures in a more sustainable direction. So most of us don't have direct control over how we get to work, necessarily how we heat our homes, all of these sorts of things. So it's about a choice infrastructure is the language that people in that sphere often use. Like, and they, some of it's nudge, some of it's about enabling people to do the right thing. Um, so it can be about building regulations, retrofitting houses, uh, electric, um, electric buses, those sorts of things to reduce reliance on cars. It's about just shifting infrastructures in ways which enable the change you want to see. So that's partly around mainstreaming and scaling out in that way. But it also means descaling the, the less desirable stuff. <laughs> and so that was the other side of the thing we mentioned around behavior change was the need to tackle what we refer to as the polluter elite. So there are sort of key behavior hotspots and there are key social groups that are obviously contributing most to some of these problems. And so a more targeted approach has to be aimed at those behaviors and, and changing the behaviors of those groups. And th those imply very, very different sort of policy strategies and levers. So it does very much change, um, the question of scale depends on what you're trying to, to scale and descale, um, and and also the context. And this relates a little bit to the to the the question from uh, James on incentives, because it's no point me saying here's the recipe for dealing with these problems. Because if you're in Denmark or China or Canada or South Africa or wherever you might be, the mix of things that you need to use, the levers at your uh, um, disposal. Are going to be very different you know we do need different theories of change for different contexts so i can list some of the incentives which might be like feed-in tariffs taxes regulations all of these sorts of things and it's always going to be bundles of those things um we wrote a book um with a load of sussex colleagues some years ago years ago on the, the politics of green transformations and we talked about state-led market-led citizen-led technology-led pathways but inevitably those pathways always overlap <laughs> and intertwine, right? Um, so often, you know, governments are going to be the ones that create markets in the first place, but private actors can lead in other ways. And then cities might adopt some of those innovations or governments might adopt some of those innovations. So society led pathways are, you know, generating new grassroots innovations, um, creating social capital, etc. So it's always going to be some sort of combination of these things. So um, it's hard to say what are what's the sort of top 10 incentives we need to shift things in a different direction. Um, using taxation quite a lot works well in Europe. It's sometimes harder in certain parts of North America. Um, supporting citizen-led innovation is quite possible and, and there's strong traditions of it in Scandinavia, for example, but it'd be a whole lot harder to do that in China, <laughs> etc. So we need to adapt our sort of theories of change and the types of incentives that we, we want to employ to the context and the problem. Because again, it's very different if you're talking about climate as opposed to trying to deal with biodiversity loss or, or some other issue. So that's a classic academic way of saying it all depends, but in a way, it all depends. <laughs> um, so there's, you know, we have to get the incentives right, but it's, it's partly a sense of going with the grain and reading the political landscape and also timing, you know? Uh, we were just talking while you were all in groups about um, the ban on um, uh, petrol cars in this country. And even a few years ago, if you said to me that there's going to be a ban on this and, and the whole fleet will have to be electric by 2030, I would have laughed at you and said, that's just impossible. There's no way that can come about. But timing, coincidence, contingency, these things came together and you actually have a conservative government pushing that through um, against the interest of some of the car industry, which they're very close to. So you, I couldn't possibly have imagined that coming about. So you get the, you then get these windows of opportunity where you need to really push for, for positive change. You know, Naomi Klein talks about this in terms of shock doctrine. There's these moments of disorientation where things are up in the air. And if you've got good ideas about how to push it forward, that's your moment and you have to seize it and go for it. Really, thanks again, Peter, for, um, for sharing all your wisdom, being part of our community. And thank you for, uh, to everyone for coming today. It was a pleasure to see so many friendly faces and meet some new ones as well. So be well and uh, hope to see you soon.